Thank you very much and welcome again to another edition of My Northern Achiever with me, Abdul Jalil Nabiali, and I am the son of Musa Kumo. Last week, we had a very great guest in our midst and we couldn't finish what we were discussing because the conversation went interesting, but then we had to cut it short because of time. And today we are going to continue with him. But before we continue with this conversation, as usual, I'm going for a very quick commercial break and when I am back, we'll start the show. Don't go away. Thank you very much for staying with my Northern Achiever and today my guest is the one I had last week, the great lawyer Mumuni. So to say that is how we all know him from Kumbungu. You told me last week that uh, your father was a peasant farmer, your mother a trader, yet still you are able to climb to this highest level of education. How were you able to do that? <laughs> That is very interesting, really. I must say, uh, I must pay homage to uh, my mother. Wow. You know, that woman, an illiterate woman, a village woman, she'd never come into contact with an educated person. But somehow, she had this strange inspiration for education for, education for her child. Wow. And it all arose from some interesting circumstances. I told you, after class six, we had to go to middle school yeah. in a different town in Savrugo. Yes. That morning we were supposed to leave Kumbungu and go to Savrugo. The night before there was a heavy downpour and the hall, the zone of my father's house had collapsed. And then our, my elder brothers had all gone to Kumasi. You know, my, it was just me and my younger brother. So we were the ones who were trying to clear the debris, you know, yeah. from this yeah. thing. Yeah. You know, I had a classmate from, from class one whose house, not far from my house, and whose mother and my mother, they used to compare news. So my mother went out and met Mparamina, and she said, ah, these boys, they say they are going to their college today. My mother said, ah, today? Say yes. So Ibrahim is ready. So my mother came home and said, oh, why you, why? You, I know supposed to go, go, going to get ready. Then my father said, look, He's not going anywhere. I'm blind. And that time my father had become blind. Oh. I'm sitting here. I put you in school. Today I'm here. I'm being taken care of. How can I look after you in school? Stay home and farm for me to eat. Oh. But my mother said, no way. This boy, he has to go. She can't go. <laughs> she so from that day, that woman took that responsibility. I carried my box, she followed me to the head teacher's house, she took my trans transfer uh, letters, she accompanied me to the marketplace, we took, I took a vehicle, and she made sure, even while I was in Banjale, when she comes to South Local Market, she must come there. And see me, give, give me something, to, we, will, we will cry together, and then she will leave. There's no school that I went that she didn't come. Tamasco, she will come looking, say, oh, being kana o yun bo mahamaru. That's how they call me at home. You know, they say, ah, kumbum biso bitya, then they will go. Finally, even in Legon as a student, I sat there one day, they came and said some old lady was looking for me. It was my mother. So that woman really was the inspiration, powerful force behind. She will cajole, she will plead, she will beg, she will say, Ayanam Nusonga, Ayepsal Nusonga, Ayep, you know, yeah, she will do all this. Just encourage. Keep on on. And when I was called to the bar as a lawyer, and I went home and I said, Mama, finally this thing is over. She had raised a good Bulalan tablet. She said, Look, you don't care, you know, to call okay, you, you departed. Wish you are like me. <laughs> you know, this reminds me of my own tussles and hustles with my own mom. Hajia Sahara, God bless you. Uh, thank you so much, and all our moms for all that you've been doing for us. Thank you so much, mothers. And uh, you know what she did? She was selling shea butter. Yeah. She was selling shea butter. Because of me, she developed it. She would buy it in bowls, send to Kumasi, stay there for two weeks, sell, come back. 
you know, and she kept saying that it's you who made me a trader. Because she didn't want a situation when I would come and say I want something. Because she will remember the day she took control from my father. All right, so there we have it. And, uh, you know, I'm lost for words. But then we have to continue the interview. I want us to jump straight into uh, what it was, you know, working under President Rawlings and President Mills how different it was because under Rawlings you were employment minister and under Mills you were foreign affairs minister these are two great leaders how are you able to work with these two people and what would you describe them well very interesting mm. you know as you, you asked me who is my godfather and I said President, President Rawlings I just told you what my relationship with President Rawlings was uh, before I became an MP, before he made me a cabinet minister, yeah. and uh, we worked together, mm. and he, as you know, is a very inspirational leader. Mm. Uh, he insists on integrity, and integrity is very important. And therefore, uh, those of us who really work with him closely, we endeavored to live lives that were lives of integrity yeah. not compromising the standards you know we have certain principles you know accountability probity accountability incorruptibility I mean all of this because you always believe that somebody was looking over your shoulder to find out what you were doing right or wrong you were wrong and therefore we we, we 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 really went on to try to live that kind of President Mills on the other side, yeah. also a great man of real uh, integrity, uh, incorruptibility, you know, was a hallmark. Yeah. You know, uh, Mr. Kwame Piemi, yeah. who is a prominent MPP, MPP member, member, have mentioned that he was personally aware of how people went to bribe President Mills. And he rejected them. Uh, with a, an and envelope. And he rejected it. So one day I was with the president and I asked the president, is it true that what happened? He laughed. <laughs> what is that? I said, okay, you know what? I mean, this has to be like a prisoner. And I'm not paying for anything. The food that I eat, the water that I drink, the petrol, everything. That's what I need for me to be amassing wealth. You know, I have two houses, one in Medina, one at Ophan. The one at Ophan, when I was a lecturer, he gave me that plot and I told him, I don't need another house. Why should I? I mean, that is to tell you what that man really was. And therefore, he inspired us to be humble. You know. I will tell you some other interesting thing. One day, Gage Mercer, the U.S. Mm -hmm. I was still standing. I went into the office of his excellency, the president, said the Mills, and he was lamenting. And you could see he was so he was disturbed. Boring. And you know, he told me, look, George Mensah has served this country mm. the best he can. And this one, I just have information that he's in financial distress. The president told me this. I'm emboldened to say this. I didn't want to say it because some people will say that, ah, because maybe he's a political opponent, I was trying to give him a bad Recently, Ambassador Dika was a who was secretary to President Kufo, and who is a relation of uh, George Mansa, actually said publicly that George Mansa died a power. Wow. Then, when I heard that, I remembered what the news said. said. So the news told me that look, this man has served this country with all his heart, and he led a life of security. He did not amass wealth, and I got information that he's in financial district. I'm told that he subsequently arranged a little package for him. For him. Now, this is his political opponent, but he admired him and was concerned about the fact that just because he was incorruptible. Wow. That's how great that man was. So I think I, I'm sure if we allowed you, you would have gone on and on and on and on because these are people you worked so closely with. But then. The people of Kumbungu, for instance, have castigated your name a lot. You know, I know you know about some of this. Do you regret ever serving them? 
certainly not. Certainly not. I would wish that I could even do it again. I would wish that my children would do it. I would wish that the several young people in Kumbu would do the same. Know what I do and who I admire will carry on the mantle and serve the people of Kumbu. You know, I was mentioning, and I mentioned just electricity, I mentioned the road. The OIC center, for instance, everybody knows how it happened. I bet you'll have to seize it from somewhere. I won't mention where. <laughs> okay. You know, the center, which now is the best entertainment place in the whole of this area. Even uh, artists in Tamale, uh, they, they, they flock to Kumu yeah, from yeah. that uh, theater, yeah. the, the, the community center. Yes. You know, I, 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 I brought it. Following uh. my relations with the Iranian foreign minister, you know, who came into the country and donated some money for us to do this So, I can't think of anything in Kumungu really that you have no hand in. Development that I have not been part of or initiated. All right then. So now let's let's come to talk about. Uh, Politics of interest, uh, politics of uh, insults generally. You know, the Ghanaian political culture is seemingly or has turned into something of insults and name castigating. You know, what is your overview of our political culture with regards to insults? Yeah, it is the most unfortunate. Hmm. It's only when people don't have good ideas, it's only when people don't have anything substantial to boast about that they will indulge in name calling, in insults, etc. I just told you the example of President Mills and J. H. Mensah. Reaching out to, history. yeah. But he admired the man and he was very concerned that the man, after serving this country so loyally, was in, 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 in this place. These are, these are great minds. President Lord Mills was called Adjus Yeah. He won't even think about insulting anybody. No, he was concerned about this way. President Rollins, if he insults you, it's because you are yeah. betraying some of the principles that he, he stands for, you know, and he, he, he will stand to compromise on it. But idle talk, pure insult, hmm. disregarding the, 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 the principles, politics of ideas has eluded people. Yeah. It's a big shame. And it's a tragedy for this country. So now you are an international man, so to say, because uh, you have done some works internationally, and you were appointed to complete the tenure of Dr. Mohamed Ibn Chambers uh, by ECOWAS uh, to, as the secretary of the African Caribbean Pacific Group of Nations. So, you know, tell me a little about it. Well, you know, uh, this is a, a group of uh, seventy-nine developing countries. Uh, from Africa, from the Caribbean, mm. and from the Pacific. These okay. were former colonies of the great powers, so to speak. And then when they decided to form the European Union, they, they decided that, look, they could not go ahead and leave behind their yeah, African and other colonies. So okay. they created a situation whereby they uh, in the colonies to be able to continue development assistance and support Therefore, the ACP, the African Caribbean Pacific Organization, was formed and headquartered in Brazil. Okay. Incidentally, also headquartered the European Union. Union. So that there was collaboration between the European Union and the ACP. Okay. Basically, that's what it was. And the channel development. Do you think politics generally has done Ghanaians more good? Especially in view of the fact that Ghanaians today see politicians as being too corrupt. Well, it's unfortunate, really, because clearly politics has been good for this country. Okay. Yes, but for, pol uh, but for politics, it will also be under the yoke of colonialism. Mm. Kwame Kuma had a dream and he had to live that dream and he had to do it through politics, really, to be able to achieve self-government, independence, political emancipation for our country and to champion our development. You know, at the time he was doing it, uh, he was in prison, yeah. he was uh, given all kinds of uh, uh, difficulties, 
even his own countrymen and women would fight him, him. understand him, harass him, they threw bombs at him, they tried to kill him. Finally, they masterminded his overthrow. Uh, but still, young people of this country today who didn't even live, who were not born during the Kwame Nkrumah era, they have read Kwame Nkrumah's uh, history, yeah. they have read his legacies, history. they've heard his speeches, and they are inspired by it. Mm. That is politics. The of politics. So politics is good for this country. Now, do you agree with those who are of the view that Ghanaian politics is so much polarized? You know, do you agree or not? And why? I certainly agree mm. that polarization has really taken hold of our politics mm. to the greatest detriment of the development of our country. Today, political discussion, in a discussion that is really geared at an ethnic ideas, a, a, a contest of ideas mm. becomes bastardized yeah. and becomes a purely NDP NDC issue. Thing, issue. Mm. You know, something that comes up that you should really address and talk about it. You know, Dispassionately. And then build national consensus based on the conclusions that you will together draw. You know, it's lost. Because somebody immediately comes up and says, ah, this is an NDC thing. And this is ah, an NDC thing. So what can we do to stop such polarization in the country? Well, it has to do with a lot of conscientization, okay. a lot of education, you know, people really, especially the younger people, people of your age, yeah. really, uh, got to really appreciate the fact that there's a lot more at stake for this country than just NDC and NDC that, you know, the, 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 the destiny of uh, should, should be discussed. You know, devoid of partisanship, you know, devoid of, you know, insults and name calling and etc. That people should be able to engage in conversations that are totally uh, dominated by uh, the feelings of demo democracy yeah. and then the development of uh, uh, found people and the nation at large. That's important, particularly the media houses. The media houses. They really should show the way yeah. because they have yeah. a platform huh. and they are the gatekeepers and they must really ensure that people that come onto their platforms, you know, to the national interest. So now, what can be done in your view to bring about lasting peace to Dabo? Yes. You know, let's intertwine it with what Rollins told you some few absolutely, years back. Absolutely. You know, and that is what really was the last thing that pulled me into the NDC. He said, look, the development agenda is the more important thing. If there is hunger, it doesn't care whether you are Abudu or Andani. If there is disaster, it doesn't care whether you are Abudu or Andani. Development, development, development. And I saw on that NDC platform, I actually saw the Abudu people there, yeah. and I saw the Andani people there, and they worked together. And because of that, we had a very long period when chieftaincy was no longer a central issue in our politics. I remember in the 2000 runoff, yes, yes, sure. Ibrahim Mahama held the late Aliou Mohammed's hand yeah. to Radio Savannah and yeah. said, "Look." The Gwamba Yimira to vote Tiku Foko D Abu Yilla Hakan and then Yilla Hakan to the Namoma Bishablay and Damle. Politics not like cut to Nama He did that. What happened in March 2002 was what set the clock back. It was unfortunate. You know, but it can still be solved. We can still achieve what we achieved before March 2002. You know, I am the bang. Walk at the shelter, I what I shall die. Come on, come on, be sure then to some man's own pay and this. President Mills, President Rollins, die, young mommy. Yama, come now. I am the bang. Tremble, dolly, I will be under. Politics, but none the latter. 
kama niribu zabra ka zang zabla man chang te pergi ya ni mbo pula kama mbi no the way the kind azang la politics ma ncheka bu zabla ma kar pi ka zang ba lan tab ni ka shetaba ke zang yi za za zang pala lebe gan sim pula we abnya ndc abnya abri no ka berne abnya ndan yi no ka berne we ka te la ka te ka zang te pa nzu ya ngun taba ntumda kan shir kulli kar nyela yal ma le kan shir kulli kar nyela politics ma 2000 Trayen chang politics mana? Di belah dola anda yang non parti bong, abu yang non parti bong. Dala kene. Kalau suci coba hal kalau Ibrahim Muhammad sokam dah mikir bang, uni nyan dan ilzu. Ko bagi aliu Muhammad abu yang non mera. Chang Savannah Radio. Nanti ya degan ba anda yang non mera. Ini anak kat vote ti presiden kufuko odi. Domit mabim bong aliu Muhammad. Kodi. Ni ni la tena mala yetu akiwe tia dla kane dla kate politics fu ni pia yule diya la ne la kuraya kanda yule ma shirini na mtu vote kaku fuadi bini shirini na tena ne ya March 2002 na ya ku ku bini ni bini shirini na lafsi bini shakam ni anga bini na lafsi tini anga try la Kalau lah ya tua pun, tu dengan lapsa tu yang ama dengan kulit jam, tu cek kat tu indak bamba kat bank kadama ah dia kuma tebi tu yang se, tu cum tu barna pam, tu cum tu barna tu yang dulu ni ya tua ilmu ma akungko, tu ku cang tu, tu ku cang tu. Kau bawa tu aku kau jen dulu pada indak bamba, kau bawa tu, kau bawa tu, semua dapat seluruh. Bijilah terbuat dengan mala cerpen yang pahai North Eastern region. Cerpen dah bangba, ya na teng bangba. Sudikan. Belilah tu nampak nampak petap ma. Kebang dah. Jadi kulit itu ma. Besar yang ma terpatu zumba. Ama debang alal zah kusai ni ya na teng bane. Di ni ni ane di ni bagi mencang terbiar cerpen. Di kuto nang. Ama zuzon bo bo bursalme, bo bursalme, bo bursalme ma karnya la bo minute da bamba tunere bo pata ba. Na ona mal da ba. So in fact, this is where we would draw down the curtains for now, just for a quick commercial break. When we come back, we are going to talk much more and conclude on this session. Don't go away. We are back shortly. Thank you so very much for staying on, on with my Northern Achiever, with me Abdel Jalil Nabiale, and I still have with me lawyer Mohamed Mumuni, former Foreign Affairs Minister, former uh, Employment Minister, and former so many things like I said before. And before we went for the commercial break, we were talking about Dagbong and how to bring lasting peace to Dagbong. Now, Council, let me ask this. What do you think is the role of Elite like you and others in bringing about lasting so solutions to Dagba or lasting peace to Dagba. The role of the elite in this Dagba affair is crucial. They need to be honest themselves. They need to look beyond their noses. They need to recognize the central importance of peace and development of Dagbang. They need to understand that the destiny of the Dagbang people rests in the hands of the Dagbang people. It is only we, the Gombers, who can solve our problem. They need to appreciate that fact. And they need to really engage with each other. Engage with each other on a level of mutual respect, on a level of honesty, on a level of total commitment to a solution that is lacking that's why we are where we are so i am putting i am putting this challenge to you sir that just like you did for the self-electrification for kumbungu just like you did for 
galvanizing other people to set up Bonza Rural Bank. I am putting this as a challenge to you to galvanize the elite. Let's see how together we can put, bring our heads and solve this particular problem once and for all. And I do believe that you really can do this. And uh, we are looking up to you and other elite people. But then, what is your general overview of the youth of today? Yeah, well, you know, the youth is the future of any community. The youth are the future leaders of any community. So their role is very crucial, especially in preparing them for that leadership. It is crucial. Unfortunately, the, the youth of today are confronted with too many problems. The problem of youth unemployment is a canker. Because if you don't have the means of survival, if you don't have an income, you know, your confidence is at the lowest end. So it is a big challenge. So we need really to find a way to create jobs so that our people, the youth especially, can be meaningfully engaged to realize their self-confidence. But it also has to do with our educational system. You see, for, for too long, we are churning out employees yeah. and not employers. Yes. Our education should equip us in such a way that when you come out, you're not just coming out to be looking for a job. You are coming out to realize yourself, to be an entrepreneur, to be yourself an employer. One day you'll be employing people. Other communities, that's what they have done. But the mindset we have is that I'm looking for a job, I want a job, so that at the end of the month you go and sign vouchers and you'll be paid. And that is it's not the fault of the youth, it's the fault system. of our educational system. We should be training entrepreneurs. And then when they come out, we should make it possible for them to be able to get startup capitals and then you know, they should be able to develop bankable projects that they can get some financial support, etc. It's a whole package. Yeah. We haven't done that. So we need to get to this in order to, you know, push the youth forward. But then, there is no doubt, and it's not a secret, that the youth of today behave so uncultured. And there's too much waywardness, you know. Have parents failed in raising children? I would say yes, absolutely. Society generally has failed. You see, the, the youth, they actually mirror the community itself. There's so much indiscipline, even at the level of the adults. You see, when we were growing up as children, every adult, every adult was a parent. And a parent with responsibility yes. towards every child, not only his children. You know, even outside, if you saw a child doing something that was drastically, that was wrong, you were expected as an adult to take steps correct. to correct that child. And when you do, you will be congratulated. Today, you dare not touch somebody's child. Everyone has a right. Everyone has a right. You see, that's where society has failed. So in clear terms, who do you blame for youth and cultured behavior today? Well, you know, the family as a unit is the basic unit of society. And all of us are from homes, from families, or we are expected to be from families. Yeah. And the problem of a culturalization, the problem of education, the problem of socialization in the early stages is the responsibility of the family. Many families have failed to carry out that, that responsibility. You know, schooling, a lot of these children, they drop out from school very early, boys and girls, and then that's it. So once he's out, out there, no control, you know, it's up to, the devil finds work for the idle hands. So that 
is a basic problem. It's also a problem for the society at large. Society at large has allowed, there's a, there's a total collapse in our moral values, you know, in our principles. And therefore, the children, they don't learn some of these values. And therefore, they don't even respect them. That's another problem. So let's get a little back into politics a bit. Um, of all political parties in Ghana, why the NDC? Well, I told you the reason that I joined the NDC from the beginning. It was because of their development agenda. They put emphasis on development. It was all development, development, development. And they said, no, 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 we are not even interested in your chieftaincy uh, division. We think that it's unethical to exploit the differences in the people. So clearly, the, your meeting or your engagement with Chairman Rollins yes. did the magic. Okay? Absolutely. The final, the final blow <laughs> was that one, yes. So what is your relationship with him as we speak now? No, I still respect him very much you as an elder. Oh yeah, well, we haven't been together for quite some time. We haven't talked for some time now, really. But I still have a lot of uh, respect for him, uh, indeed reverence for him, because he has remained true to his principles of probity and accountability, uncompromising in our nation, the national interest, So, on that note, what are your views about, you know, his problems with key, you know, members of the party recently? Well, I think that it basically has to do with some of the principles that he, he believes in. And then the perception that people have abandoned those principles. And he takes ultimate responsibility for it. Because he's the father of the party. So do you think the NDC still has a future? Obviously the NDC has a future. And do you think it is still the political party that can change the fortunes of the country? Absolutely. Because clearly, as you, when you look at it, come to think of it, uh, the MPP won the last election on the platform of incorruptibility and castigated the NDC for corruption. Yeah. Today, everybody is witness to what is going on. Everybody is witness to what is going on. And on a level, uh, even if you can say that the NDC is corrupt, Clearly, the NPP is more corrupt for me. Yeah. The, the, that's what I see. Yeah. And therefore, I think clearly there's a future for probity and accountability. There's a future for incorruptibility. There's a future for political integrity. There's a future for any party that will espouse those principles. If it's the NDC that is espousing those principles, clearly there's a future for the NDC. Former President Mahama has shown interest in, you know, running again for president. Do you think it is wise or do you think it will help NDC? Well, you know, NDC, first and foremost, is a democratic institution. Anybody is entitled to offer himself for leadership. The final decision as to who should lead rests with the people. So if President Muhammad wants to come out, why not? If anybody else wants to come out, why not? Let them come out in their numbers and let the NDC people decide on the level of democracy who should lead them. So that means therefore that you are not in position to tell me who you think should lead NDC into 2020. Oh no, I can tell you. And I, I have told you. <laughs> I said that NDC has to go back to its core values, okay. so whoever its core principles of probity and accountability, and whoever mirrors that those values, those principles, should be the one. Should be the one. But you are not ready to tell me who amounts this flag bearer, you know, contenders, uh, mirrors these values. No, it's for, it's for the people to decide. It's for the membership of the NDC at large to decide, not me as Mohamed Mumuni. I love this evasiveness, but then let's, <laughs> let's, let's move on to finding out your advice to NDC now that they are in opposition. Yes, they should remain true to the national interest. They should continue to fight for Ghana. They should continue to expose the supreme 
interest of the people of this country. They should imbibe the principles of property and accountability and they should insist on it and go forward with it. They should, in fact, get crazy about property and accountability. They should challenge the, 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 the government, uh, the, the, the party in power. So, in 2004, you were the running mate to Professor Mills, then candidate Mills, and uh, you lost power, or you didn't capture power. Now, subsequently, in 2008, you were replaced with uh, John Muhammad, yes. and eventually, they won power. Yes. This could have been you. Well, yes. Yes. How possible. did you feel? that you were dropped for John Mahama? Well, just much in the same way that I felt in 2004, the choice was between me and John Mahama. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. And I was picked. Okay. But in politics, the dynamics don't stay the same. They don't stay the same. They change. And in politics, even one week is a very long time. Not talk about one year or four years. Yes. So the dynamics have changed between 2004 and 2008. And the NDC had to sit back and evaluate the situation and decide who had the best advantage for the, the party in terms of winnability. And it was John Mahama. And that was the decision of the party. And you accepted it? I accepted it in good faith. And I worked with it. I had no problem with it. Not too many people would endure such. You know, some people haven't even gone close to this, and yet they have gone, you know, resigned from political parties and groups. <laughs> no, no, that is wrong. That's a wrong way to look at politics. Politics must not be just your self-interest. Politics must really get down to the collective, get down to the interest of the totality, of the country, of the people of this country, not you as a person, you know. Uh, so you, 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 you really have to, yes, personal ambition is important, no question about it. But, but sometimes you have to put aside that, this that parochialism and then... Exactly, especially where the, the collective is looking in a particular direction and it's not in your direction. You have to be patient and abide your time. We are going for a very quick commercial break on this note. And when we come back, it will interest you to know that Alaji is now into farming. We'll talk much more about his farming, you know, activities and more. Don't go away. We are back shortly. Thank you very much for staying with my Northern Achiever and you are welcome back from the commercial break again. Um, I'm still with Alaji lawyer Mohamed Mumuni, former Foreign Affairs Minister of the Republic of Ghana. And um, we we're going to talk about farming. After active politics, I think you have retired from politics now. <laughs> Haven't you? Or you have? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've I, taken a sabbatical. <laughs> okay. So are you looking to become flag bearer of NDC anytime in the future? No, I don't have any immediate plans. But if yeah, but uh, you see, like I have always said, I believe in the people's decision. It's a democracy. And therefore, like me, I have offered myself for public service ever since I was just a young man. And therefore, if the decision comes that, look, this is what we want you to do, and that is the collective, that is the, 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 the interest of everybody in this country. Why not? I'll go along. Okay, so now let's talk about the farming. Um, you are into farming now. What type of farming do you do? Commercial or peasant? Yes, indeed, I'm doing some commercial farming. That's what I'm doing, mainly rice farming. Okay. You know. Um, I've seen quite huge machines packed at the, in front of your house in Kumbungu, yes. are they combined harvesters? Yes, yes. I have, uh, I have six combined harvesters. Wow. There's the New Holland, which they call the place, the very big one. Then I also have 
the truck combines. So yeah. since, since when did you start farming? Oh, 20, 2015. But I was outside. How many acres or hectares do you do roughly in a year? No, my present acreage will be around 400 for rice yeah. and then 40 for maize. That is great. So, you know, do you see yourself being the next chief farmer? No, 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 no. I'm not looking forward to that. As a matter of fact, you know, I came into the farming just very much like the way I came into politics, mm. you know, as a kind of a challenge. Okay. You know, I, I realize that our people have been into this farming for a long time, and yet we are still grappling every now and then with poverty. A lot of the big time farmers, they were, there was a time, I told you about the, the mid 70s. Yes. We had big farmers like Alaji Yakub Timbla, uh, you know, we had, you know, a whole lot of them who were sponsored by Standard Bank, uh, the late Nantona, you know, Mr. Jebia, you know, these were really, really big farmers. But with the structural adjustment and the problems that came with agriculture, a lot of them, you know, they lost out. Now, it's a new challenge. And we need to adapt the farming to the new trends yeah, of things. So that at least we can... <laughs> so when I came and I went in, I also made some early mistakes. Yeah. For instance, I went and bought that big combine. But I realized that with that big combine, you know... You can cultivate... More you can cultivate much more acres, but you cannot even harvest the rice at the time that you should be harvesting it. Mm. At the time that the mills will want it, it's not fully dried, and the ground is not is, is not firm. So the big one can go in. So we we, we harvested the rice. We couldn't get the market because the rice had over dried, you know. So we had to go back and then buy the truck the truck type that one. Even in water or marshy ground, it can go in and, 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 and have it. So, generally, if I should ask, do you think the North is poor? Of course. In terms of output, in terms of living standards, the North is definitely very poor. But in terms of potential, what God has given us, we are nowhere near poverty. It's an attitudinal thing. It's in our, in our minds. We are refusing to apply ourselves in the manner that we should. That's why we are poor. Do you still play tennis now that you are in? Because <laughs> I know tennis is one of your hobbies. That is true. I stopped playing tennis, you know, because as you know, I had an accident. Two accidents. One, I broke my arm at a tennis game. That didn't stop me from playing tennis. But subsequently, I had this accident and broke my my leg, and all of that. I can't, I can't run play tennis. Again. So generally, what piece of advice do you have for young graduates and young entrepreneurs? Yeah, uh, well, they really need to study the situation carefully and start to take action however small, they should be very committed and they should be determined. Honesty is very important. A lot of our young people, they start and they go wayward, they believing that they can cut corners and make it. No, there's no way you can cut corners and make it because if you if you do dupe this person today and dupe this person tomorrow, by the time you get to the third person, it has gone around everywhere that you are not a, 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 a credit worthy person. You are not a credible person. So you have to be honest and sincere. And you have to be aggressive, creative, you know, persistent. You don't just start and then succeed overnight. You have to start, you know, it may fall, get up, you fall, it's not so many, uh, how many times you fall, but how many times you, 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 you get up after falling. That's what it is, you know. It's easy to just say it, really. But I tell you that, that's what it is. I can tell you, 
At the time that some of us went to school, in Tamasco, for instance, you know, I went to Tamasco without even one single white shirt, which is what we were using for classes. The only shirt I had was a piece left over from my mother's uh, cover that they sewed into a shirt. I went to form one, the president Kumbuna, they were in upper six. My mother, as usual, followed up to Tamasco and then somehow brought me before Kumbuna, who was then a, a prophet and in upper six, and said, I brought you your younger brother to take care of him. He went and brought me one of his shirts, white shirt. It was like a smoke, but I was, I was tiny, you know. <laughs> but then, after a short while, school uniform, they were supplying us school uniform, even sandals, they were supplying us all kinds of things. Even the food that we were eating in school, we couldn't get that kind of food to eat in our homes, you know. <laughs> so things were a lot easier then than now. Now is it's, it's, it's difficult. I will not go without talking a little about some of the policies of the NPP and what you think about them. What do you think about free senior high school? Free, free senior, senior high school. Well, I think it's good. The basic idea is good that everybody must have education, that everybody must have secondary education. That really will be launching us into the system whereby people can realize self-actualization, people can realize themselves. But then, you see what is going on. What we are getting is free from quality as well. So you see, you are going in there and then you are not really getting what it really should be. We have politicized the issue. The idea is good. The implementation has not been well thought through because it was a political manifesto issue. The, the whole concept has not been discussed. We haven't built any national consensus because it was a political, a political party's agenda. The other people are sitting aloof. But it should be a total thing. We should all come together at the national conference, free education, we debated and tested and built national consensus. That brings up back How the to same political polarization we're talking about. Exactly. That's the unfortunate thing. So it's a, it's a brilliant idea, but it's, very, it's been very poorly uh, executed because it has not been thought through and it has, doesn't have the, that national feel. How do you relate with your wife and children? <laughs> Excellent. I live for them. Yes. Because they are my responsibility, the way I always look at it. I have, I have six children. And my wife, you know, my wife is also a retired teacher. She's, she's in Accra. My children, I think three of them are outside the country. Three are here. You saw one today. He, he's he the lawyer. The chamber, he's uh, going to hear the law chambers. Okay. You know, he's, I think he's starting very well. Uh, I just talked to my daughter who had a wedding here last year. Okay. And, uh, Any other daughters who match my age? Oh, no, I have only one, unfortunately, and she's married. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate for you. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's, it's been wonderful speaking <laughs> with you, but then before we take leave of you, do you listen to Northern music? Oh, certainly. I'm a real fan of Northern music. I love it. You know, contemporary or...? Contemporary, old, ancient, all of that. Who is your favorite musician? Uh, currently, I listen to the music and I love the thing. Then I say, ah, but who sang this one? <laughs> <laughs> so then they say, oh, it's fancy garden. I said, ah, oh, okay. You know, but uh, this lady, this lady, Gunu, Gunu, Sherifa Gunu is absolutely fantastic. I love her music. You know. okay. Araji, yeah. let's take, before you take, we take leave of you, I want to take your final words. What yeah. are your final words to the people of Ghana? Yes. Uh, my final words really is that we live in a global village. 
decisions taken elsewhere will impact us whether we like it or not. So we must endeavor to integrate into that global world. And the world is dominated by knowledge. Yeah. If you don't have know-how, even if you have resources, you wouldn't come to nothing. We need to acquire the know-how. You know, countries like Singapore, they don't have natural resources. They have nothing. Even sand, they import. Water, they import. And yet, they are a very developed country. We should also begin to think about how we can, you know, industrialize, how we can make use of our abundant natural resources. Instead of just continuing to export our products in a raw state. We've been exporting cocoa for how many uh, centuries? And we are still uh, exporting it in that state. No, look at our gold. We're not making the, the best out of our gold. Now oil. And now oil. This, this is the kind of situation. We, we really need to acquire what it takes to industrialize value addition moving forward. It's important. Now, who would you want to send shout outs to? You know, people that you want to say hello to before we take leave of you finally. Oh, yes, certainly. My people in Kumbungo, I love you. Uh, you've made me what I am. And I'm happy that I'm still here and I'm with you and I can, I'm, I'm still prepared to serve you. Uh, I like to also say, my, my, my mentors, my political uh, uh, godfathers, as you said it, President Rawlins, clearly, uh, I owe you so much. The late President Mills, I owe so much to you. Uh, professionally, you know, the likes of Ibrahim Mahama, they, they have played key roles in my, in my, my development, even as a, as, 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 as a lawyer. There are so many of them, really. I am not in a position in this short time to mention all of them. But clearly, they did whatever they did, not for the glory of it, but as a duty to a son. And I'm happy that I have been able to vindicate their hopes and their aspirations. Well, proximate people, this is where time would allow us on the program for today. And this will be the, the last for Alaji lawyer, Mohamed Mumuni. For my crew, Thank you so much for making this production a success. And I would like to say a very big shout out to Prince Bukadi of Zara Radio and to everyone who follow My Northern Achiever. Until I come your way next week, I remain Abdul Jalil Nabiali. I am the son of Musa Kumo. See you again next week. Bye bye for now. <laughs>